my topic for today's presentation is diagnosis and management of lisfranc injuries so the word lisfranc has been coined after this famous french surgeon who was a gynecologist and who described an amputation through the tarsal metatarsal joint after a severe gangrene so the lisfranc injuries is a spectrum of injuries which involves the tmt joints and the intercuniform joints where one or more of the metatarsals are displaced with respect to the tarsus bones so you can get very high energy fracture dislocations which have got significant soft tissue damage with poor functional outcomes or you can get subtle lisfranc injuries which are very commonly missed so coming to the anatomy it's a very complex anatomy with multitude of ligaments you got dorsal introsis and plantar ligaments connecting the multiple metatarsals but your main ligament is your lisfranc ligament which is between your second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform so you can either get a twisting injury of the midfoot an axial loading of a plantar flex foot or a severe road traffic accident with crush injuries involving the lisfranc joint okay for the fractures we normally use the myerson classification which is normally divided into three groups so you can get total incongruity you can get partial and a divergent variety for lisfranc sprains we use the nunley classification so stage 1 there is no diastasis and there is just a sprain of the lisfranc ligament in stage 2 there is a rupture along with diastasis of around 2 to 5 mm in stage 3 along with these above changes you can also get a loss of the longitudinal arch height so clinically patients will present with midfoot pain there is going to be swelling uh, sometimes a deformity with severe dislocation and a plantar ecchymosis is a very pathognomonic sign of a lisfranc injury you might also get a dorsalis pedis artery injury hence a careful neurovascular examination is very important also rule out a compartment syndrome in patients of suspected lisfranc sprain you can elicit the piano key sign where you can stress the second tarsal metatarsal joint imaging wise it's important to get all the three views ap lateral and your oblique views always try to get a weight bearing x ray if possible so on the ap x ray what you need to do is a draw few lines which will indicate whether your lisfranc joint is intact or no also the first line which you draw is your lateral border of the first metatarsal in line with the lateral border of the medial cuneiform the second line is the medial border of the second metatarsal along with the medial border of the middle cuneiform so this is on the ap x ray on the oblique x rays you should draw lines from the lateral cuneiform medial border to the medial border of the third metatarsal and the medial border of the cuboid with the medial border of the fourth metatarsal so this will give you some idea whether your lisfranc joint complex is stable or not okay it's very important to get stress x rays weight bearing x rays because it's very commonly seen in our practice that we miss these uh, lisfranc sprains so you can see a bit of diastasis between your m2 and c1 which will indicate that there is a lisfranc injury okay quite often you'll get these small flake signs which is an osseous fragment which represents a lisfranc ligament avulsion equally important are your lateral weight bearing x rays which will reveal sagittal plane instability ct scan is also very important it will det detect some associated fractures as well as help in formulating a proper surgical plan mri is useful in sprains where there is no radiological evidence of instability hence it helps in identifying either partial tear or subtle injuries so the indications of non operative management are if there is less than 2 mm of displacement Uh, of the tarsal metatarsal joint in any plane and injuries which present with painful weight bearing and tenderness on palpation but it fails to exhibit instability on radiographs so you can manage this non weight bearing in a cast for 6 weeks it's very important to do repeat x-rays every 2 weeks okay once the swelling and pain decreases to detect if there is any further displacement indications of open reduction acute fractures more than 2 mm displacement it is favored more in bony fractures as compared to purely ligamentous injuries unstable sprains and younger patients okay there are two important concepts whenever you are fixing a lisfranc fracture so first it's your tri column theory so you should ensure that the middle column and your medial column are rigidly fixed and you should maintain a flexible fixation for your lateral column second is the roman arch concept so if you look at your uh, metatarsal base it forms a, a transverse arch with respect to the cuneiform and the second metatarsal is recessed relative to the other articulation forming a very stable mortise with the second tmt joint acting as an important keystone so when you fixing your fractures maintain make sure that you maintain this stable osseous architecture 
So list frank injury is very widely. I'll just give you a brief outline. What is the strategy? So first is you need to restore the relationship between the cuneiforms and the navicular. Then comes your second metatarsal and the medial cuneiform. After this, between your second metatarsal and the middle cuneiform, and then sequentially start fixing your first, third, fourth, and the fifth columns. So once the patient is under anesthesia, it's very important to do an intraoperative stress testing before you open it up. Because quite often you will find some additional instability. As you can see on the CRM image, there's an instability on even, even in the first TMT joint. You can do a plantar stress test to look for sagittal pain instability. Okay, approaches either use a single approach or a dual approach, depending upon how many columns you need to uh, approach. So the first step is intercuniform stabilization, put in a positional screw from the medial to the middle cuneiform. Second is stabilize the first ray, restore the medial column so that it acts as a strut for fixing your list frank joint. The sec then the next step comes is use a reduction clamp, reduce your list frank joint and then stabilize your second TMT and your list frank joint. You then need to put your home run screw starting from the base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform. So this trajectory is usually more preferred because the threaded portion of the screw is there in the larger medial cuneiform. So you can get a much better purchase and quite often you get some metatarsal base fracture. So if you insert a screw from the cuneiform end, there is a possibility of that you might displace that fracture. Next comes your medial column fixation. Use either a screw or a locking plate. Then comes your middle column. That's your second and the third columns. Use screws or plates. And then finally, you need to do a flexible fixation of your lateral columns. So most preferable is using a K wire. There's always a controversy whether to fuse it or fix it. Okay, the indications of primary arthrodesis is purely ligamentous injuries when there is massive combination with significant damage and chronic list frank injuries. Okay, whether to use screws and plates, the problem with screws is, is that it, it, it can damage the articular cartilage of around 2 to 6 percent. So nowadays we are frequently using plates which gives much stiffer fixation and also avoids additional damage to your joints. Removing the hardware, you can do it at around 4 months post surgery. The advantage is that it allows some physiological motion through the joint, but potentially it can lead to late diastasis if your ligament hasn't healed sufficiently. So Van Pelt and his study has felt that even if you retain the hardware, most of his patients have done really well and uh, you don't need to take out the implants in such cases. Post-operative, keep them non med bearing in a cast for 6 weeks, start gradual med bearing and give them an insole with a medial art support. Complications, infection, wound healing problems, you can get involvement of the deep peroneal nerve, you can get a midfoot deformity with, uh, with sag and abduction, hardware prominence, breakage of your implants, arthrosis, CRPS and DVT. So I'll just quickly enumerate a few cases. So this is a case of Lisfranc sprain. You can see a diastasis. I just fixed percutely with screws across the intercuniform and the Lisfranc joint. That's at nine months post-op. Second case, you can see a flake, flake sign now, which represents an instability at the second TMT joint. But when I screened this patient under anesthesia, there was also an instability in the first TMT joint. So did a two column fixation with uh, bridging plates. That's at six weeks post-op. Third case, you can see a massive disruption in the middle column and the lateral column. Of Even on the lateral x-ray, you can see a dorsal subluxation. That's the Hello. stress x-ray. Time is up. Just one more case. Sir. Okay. That's the lateral x-ray and uh, the stable fixation of all the four columns. And this is the final, that's a one year post post follow-up. That's the final case of a missed list franks, 50 year old female. If you see the initial x-ray, you could see a mild diastasis. That's a three months again, you can see Again, a subluxation of the joints, six months, there is mild arthritis, there is an abduction deformity of midfoot with a sag. And then this was finally managed with a midfoot fusion. You can see the calcaneum pitch is now well restored. So to summarize, list frank injuries are uncommon but serious with long term consequences. Misdiagnosis can lead to increased morbidity. You need to maintain a very high index of suspicion, main, uh, get appropriate imaging, use stress maneuvers. The physician should have a thorough understanding of the biomechanics and the anatomy and you should focus on anatomic reduction and rigid fixation to get improved patient outcomes. Thank you.